There are a number of interesting features of irreversibility that I think I would like to illustrate. One of them is to, is to see how exactly an irreversible machine really works. Suppose that we build something that we know ought to work only one way. And what I'm going to build is a, we, a wheel with a ratchet on it. A ratchet means just this, that we have a notched wheel with steps. So, I've drawn the wrong way for what I'm used to thinking about it. No, I had it right. <laughs> this way, there's another notch and a sawtooth wheel like this with sharp up notches and relatively slow down notches all the way around. And then, this is a wheel on a shaft. And then on this thing, there's a little piece of pole, a thing called a pole, which is on a pivot here and which is held down by a spring. It gets in the way of the wheel, but that's small technical difficulty. <laughs> it's just two-dimensional, and actually it's set a little bit below. <laughs> now, this wheel can only turn one way. If you try to turn it this way, then these straight edge part of the teeth get jammed against the pole and it doesn't go. Whereas if you turn it the other way, it just goes right over the finger, snap, snap, pop, 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 this way you use them in clocks, so when you wind watches, they have this kind of a thing inside so that you only can wind it one way. And after you wind it, it holds a spring. And now we want to discuss, you see, it's completely irreversible in the sense that the wheel can only turn one way. Now this irreversible machine, this wheel that can only turn one way, has been imagined that you could use it for a very useful thing, a very interesting thing. Because of molecular irregularities, because of molecular motion, Perpetual motion, uh, there's a perpetual motion of, of molecules, and if you build a very delicate instrument, it'll always jiggle because it's being bombarded irregularly by the air molecules in the neighborhood. So what's very clever, we'll connect this with a shaft, which is hard to illustrate in three dimensions. It goes way out here. We connect this to it with a shaft, with a vein, with a set, a wheel that has four veins. Actually, my angles of things have gotten a little bit mixed up. Look down on the shaft, this thing's got four veins like this. And those are bombarded, they're in a box of gas here. And they're bombarded all the time by the molecules irregularly. So the thing is pushed sometimes one way, sometimes the other way. But when it's pushed one way, the, this thing gets jammed. But when it's pushed the other way, it goes around. So we find the wheel perpetually going around and we have a kind of perpetual motion. That's because this wheel is irreversible. But actually, we have to look into the details. The way this works, is that when the wheel goes one way, it lifts the pawl up and then the pawl snaps down against the next tooth. And then it will bounce. If it's perfectly elastic, it'll go bounce, 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 bounce all the time. And the wheel can just go down around the other way when the pawl accidentally bounces up. So this will not work unless it's true that when the pawl comes down, it sticks or stops or bounces and cuts out. If it bounces and cuts out, there must be what we call damping or friction again. And then they're falling down and bouncing and stopping, which is the only way this will work one way. Heat is generated by the friction. So this part of the wheel over here will get hotter and hotter. But how, however, when it begins to get quite warm, something else happens. Just as there's Brownian motion or irregular motions in the gas here, so whatever this is made out of, the parts that this is made out of are getting hotter and are becoming more irregular. So a time comes when this is hot enough that the pole is simply jiggling because of the molecular motions of the things on the inside. And so it bounces up and down on here because of molecular motion, the same thing that was making this vein turn around. And in bouncing up and down on here, it is up as much as it is down. And when it is up as much as it is down, a tooth can go either way. As a matter of fact, the thing will be driven backwards. If this one was hot and this one was cold, the wheel that you thought would go only one way will go the other way. Because in the terrible bouncing up and down of this wheel, every time it comes down, it comes down on an inclined plane. And so it pushes the wheel this way. Then it bounces up again, comes down on another inclined plane, and so on. And so if this side is hotter than this side, it'll go around this way. What's it got to do with the temperature of this side? Suppose they didn't have that at all. Oh. Then, if it's pushed forward by falling on an inclined plane, the next thing that will happen is it'll bounce against that tooth, and the wheel will bounce back. But in order to prevent the wheel from bouncing back, we put a damper on it put veins in the air so it can't go. Huh? 
And then it can only it will go one way, but the wrong way. And so it turns out that no matter how you design it, a wheel like this will go the one way if this side is hotter, and go the other way if this side is hotter. But after there's a heat exchange between the two and everything is calmed down, it will neither go one way or the other. And so that's the technical way in which the phenomena of nature will go one way as long as they're out of equilibrium, as long as one side is quieter or, than the other, or one side is bluer than the other. The conservation of energy would, think, would let us think that we have as much energy as we want. We, nature never loses or gains energy. Yet the energy of the sea, for example, the thermal motion of all the atoms in the sea is practically unavailable to us. In order to get that energy organized, herded, used, make it useful, make it available for use, we have to have some place that's at a different temperature. We have to use a difference in temperature or else we'll find that the, although the energy is there, we cannot make use of it. There's a great difference between energy and availability of energy. The energy of the sea, for example, is a large amount, but it's not available to us. I think I can give an analogy to give some idea of what the difficulty is this way. The conservation of energy means that the total energy in the world is kept the same. But in the irregular jiggling, that energy can be spread about so uniformly that there's no, in a certain circumstances, that there's no way to make more go one way than the other. There's no way to control it anymore. I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but I have had uh, a going to the beach with several, many towels and so on, and sitting happily on the beach and having a tremendous downpour suddenly come, picking up the towels as quickly as you can and running into the bathhouse. Then you start to dry yourself, and you find that this towel's a little wet, but it's drier than you are. And you keep drying this one, then you find that one's too wet, it's wetting you as much as it's drying you, and you try another one, and pretty soon you discover a horrible thing. All the towels are damp, and so are you. <laughs> And then you pick, keep picking them up and putting them down and rearranging them, and there's no way to get any drier, no matter how many towels, you know you have many towels. Because there's no difference, in some sense, between the wetness of the towel and the wetness of yourself. I could invent a kind of a quantity, which I could call ease of removing water, or, uh, yeah, let's call it the ease of removing water. The towel has the same ease of removing water from it as you have. And so when you touch the towel to you, as much water comes off of you from the towel to you as it comes from you to the towel. It doesn't mean there's the same amount of water in the towel as there is on you. A big towel will have more water in it than a little towel, but they have the same dampness. Hmm? So when things get to the same dampness, then there's nothing you can do any longer. Now, the water is like the energy because the total amount of water isn't changing. But if we had a world which was limited, you see, if the bathhouse door is open and you can run into the sun and get dried out or find another towel, you see, okay, that's different, then you got saved. But if you have everything closed and you can't get away from these towels, you can't get any new towels. So if you imagine a part of the world that was closed, wait long enough, and in the accidents of the world, the energy, like the water, will be distributed all over all of the parts evenly. And there's nothing left of one-wayness there's nothing left of the real interest of the world as we experience it. Thus, in this situation here, which is a limited one, in which nothing else is supposed to be involved, the temperatures gradually become equal on both sides and the wheels doesn't go around either one way or the other. And in the same way, this situation is uh, that there is, a, if you leave a, a system long enough, it gets the energy thoroughly mixed up in it and no more energy is really available to do anything. Incidentally, the thing that corresponds to the dampness is called the temperature. And although when I say two things at the same temperature, when things get balanced, it doesn't mean they have the same energy in them. It just means it's just as easy to pick energy off of one as to pick it off the other. So if you put them next to each other, 
Nothing apparently happens. They pass energy back and forth equally. The net result is nothing. So when things have become all at the same temperature, then there's no more energy available to do anything. And the one, the principle of irreversibility is that if things are at a different temperature and are left to themselves, as time goes on, they become more and more at the same temperature. And that the availability of energy is perpetually decreasing. This is another name for what's called the entropy law, which says entropy is always increasing. But never mind the word. To state it the other way, the availability of energy is always decreasing. And that's a characteristic of the world in the sense that it's due to the chaos of molecular irregular motions. Things of different temperature left to themselves tend to become of the same temperature, but a piece of, uh, if you have two things at the same temperature, like water on an ordinary stove without a fire, the water isn't going to freeze and the stove get hot. But if you have a hot stove with ice, it goes the other way. So the one way in this is always the loss of the availability of energy.